2022 Groundfish Seminar Series. Uh, we are recording this and an MP4 file will be posted to our webpage at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center uh, after today. This is the fifth of nine weekly groundfish seminars running through December 13th. And since we are doing this seminar remotely, the speaker will use an electronic pointer or be descriptive when indicating specific points on the slide. And to help with this format and avoid additional distractions, please mute your audio and turn off your video feed. Also, please keep your questions till the end of the seminar or type them in the chat box and Liz and I will compile them for the speaker at the end. And before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind everyone to please join us next week for our um, next speaker, Julie, Julia Calderwood from the Marine Institute in Ireland, who will talk about the use of apps to assist fishers in reducing unwanted catches. And that will be held at the same time next week on Tuesday, November 8th. But today's speaker is Alex McInturf. Alex is a CICOES postdoctoral fellow at Oregon State University's Big Fish Lab. She's broadly interested in studying how threatened fisher, fishes respond to environmental change. She obtained her PhD in animal behavior from UC Davis in 2021, where she studied a variety of topics from seven gill shark movement in San Francisco Bay, basking shark distribution in the California current ecosystem, and how temperatures affect predation of juvenile Chinook salmon in California's Central Valley. In the Big Fish Lab, she is exploring the foraging, ecology, and distribution of salmon sharks in the eastern North Pacific, and she is also a National Geographic Explorer. And in this role, she has studied the social lives of basking sharks in Ireland for the last six years. In addition to research, Alex is a science communicator and co-coordinator of the Irish Basking Shark Group, an education and conservation-focused organization dedicated to basking sharks in Ireland. So thank you for joining us today, Alex, and take it away. Awesome, thank you. Um, you'll, you can hear me, right? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for coming today. Um, I am really excited to talk to you about um, a project I recently started working on, examining the diet and ecosystem impacts of salmon sharks in the Northeast Pacific. Um, I you know, got started on this project only at the beginning of this year. So I don't have a ton of conclusions yet, but I'm really excited to show you some preliminary results and and even get some feedback or ideas from folks who have been in and on the water in this region. So I'm going to start today by introducing a little bit of the background to this study. I'm going to go into some details about our objectives and methods. I will show you a sneak peek at some of those preliminary results. Um, and finally, I'm going to touch on some other collaborations that are happening to learn more about salmon sharks here in the Northeast Pacific. Right, so the Northeast Pacific is a, a really important ecosystem um, for a lot of commercially and ecologically important species. It's also very pretty, as I've come to learn. And among those species are salmon, which is probably not a surprise to a lot of you. Now, stocks of salmon in this region are pretty heavily managed, and some populations seem to be responding well to management, but that's not uniformly true. Um, and in fact, for species like Chinook salmon, which are the largest and most highly valued um, species of Pacific salmon in North America, there seems to be um, some declines or evidence of declines in the populations in spite of similar management strategies to other populations of salmon. So I just want to point you to this figure from Olberger et al. in 2018. Um, and in that top panel, in that black line, you can see that over the last few decades, we have seen a decline in catches um, of Chinook salmon in particular. Now, there are a lot of potential consequences to this, and certainly the salmon story is very complex. Um, but among these consequences are a reduction in population productivity, a reduction in the transport of nutrients from marine systems to back upstream, ecological impact on potential predators of salmon, decreased population stability um, and ability to deal with environmental perturbations, um, and finally, certainly, there's the economic impact on salmon fisheries, which is of concern. Now, 
there's been a lot of interest in examining what's driving variation in response to management for some species like the Chinook salmon. And in this paper, which is just an example, in that second panel, you can see that they looked at the effect of sea surface temperature. In the third panel, they look at climatic oscillations like the Pacific Decadal Oscillation or the North Pacific Gyre Oscillation. Um, but what I wanna draw your attention to mostly is that bottom panel where we are seeing an increase in killer whale numbers in the black line and marine mammal numbers generally in the gray line um, that corresponds to that decline in the Chinook salmon catch. So increasingly we have become interested in this idea that predators might be playing a larger role than previously considered um, in impacting these salmon stocks. And in this region, there are currently a few major players that have been examined. Um, so for example, those marine mammals, like I just showed you, but also certainly birds um, and people, of course. But a lot of work to date has also just focused on these predators and primarily on the early life history stages of salmon. So when they're in the freshwater systems, primarily when they're vulnerable as alevin fry or even as they're out migrating, However, much less work to date has been done on the adult stages of salmon um, and what sources of natural uh, mortality these salmon might be encountering. And that makes a lot of sense because it's really hard to study ocean going salmon um, as I have increasingly come to learn. There's a lot of variation in residency and movement patterns even within the same population. But another key part of the story that's missing is that there's an entire set of predators that is currently um, unexamined in terms of their role in these ecosystems. And that's actually what I joined the Big Fish Lab at Oregon State to examine. So we're really interested in kind of filling this gap and filling out these ecosystem models by incorporating these larger elasmobranch predators that often are at the top of the, the food web. So there's a lot of other um, work coming out of my lab that focuses on these other predators, but perhaps not surprisingly, um, I have become really interested in this one, which is very aptly named the salmon shark. So salmon sharks are apex predators in the Northeast Pacific, um, and they reach six to eight feet long. They are highly mobile um, and they're very efficient predators. So the reason I think they might be particularly important in this salmon story is that they have been estimated to take 12 to 25% of Pacific salmon stocks in Alaska. Now that paper was published several years ago, um, but does speak to sort of the estimated nature of their, of their predation on salmon populations. And what's very cool about this species of shark is that they are what we call regionally endothermic. So that means they can keep their body temperature above that of the surrounding water. It makes them really, really agile um, and it increases their metabolism tremendously. So therefore their energetic requirements are actually thought to be similar to those of marine mammals, those same marine mammals that are thought to also consume Chinook salmon in this system. Now, this regional endothermy has a variety of benefits, one being that they can basically roam beyond the constraints of many thermal niches that, that constrain other ectothermic fish. So what you're seeing here are satellite tag data from the Tagging of Pacific Predators project out of Stanford. Um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about these data in a few slides because that's some of the data that I'm also using for my models. Um, but what you're seeing here are just movement tracks, essentially, from satellite tagged salmon sharks. These are primarily females that were tagged in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, and all of those colors indicate the different temperatures at which those sharks were detected. So they are ranging here from 4 degrees Celsius to 24. If you're familiar with fish, fish physiology, that's a really big range. So clearly they can move throughout the entire Northeast Pacific. Um, but it does appear, as you can see on those bottom panels, that at certain times of year, um, those movement patterns vary slightly. So in the summer and autumn, we're seeing them more in coastal regions, and in winter and spring, we see them a little bit further offshore. Now, what's driving those variations in movement patterns is still un unclear. But 
unpublished data from these same um, satellite tags um, has been able to reveal a few different behavioral modes that are estimated to be transiting. So kind of those straight line tracks in blue or foraging. So more area restricted search patterns in green here. And of course, a lot of those foraging tracks are located primarily close to shore, which might be because these salmon sharks are also targeting salmon as they come out of river mouths or more coastal um, populations. But what's also interesting is we see this foraging offshore as well. And it's very possible that they are feeding on salmon in both of these locations. And if they are feeding offshore on salmon, um, we do need to consider that they might be one of these significant um, they might be creating a significant impact on um, ocean going adult salmon. So this project is not just me. Uh, there are many, many folks involved. I've been very fortunate to have many collaborators who are interested in this side of the salmon shark story. And I think maybe a few of them are online today. Um, so collectively for this postdoc, I've really been working with, with all these folks here and even beyond. And collectively, we're interested in this question. What is the impact of salmon sharks on Chinook salmon stocks here in the Northeast Pacific? Pretty straightforward, right? Okay, so we thought that these two questions can really outline the top down control of salmon sharks in this ecosystem. And in theory, they seem really simple, right? Low hanging fruit. So what are salmon sharks eating and how much? How much of that specifically is Chinook salmon? Uh, and second, how many salmon sharks are out there, right? How many are eating those salmon and where can they be found? Are they tracking salmon movement patterns or are their distributions completely separate? Are they opportunistic um, or very selective? I also like to think about these two questions in terms of scale. So for that first question, we're really looking at representative individuals to try to figure out what their diets are. Um, and then we can scale up and say, if we know what these individuals are eating, what does that mean for what the entire population is doing to those prey items? So I'm going to go through these kind of step by step and in doing so show you a few of the results that I've gotten so far. So for this first question, kind of looking at the diet, um, it's I've gotten my hands pretty dirty um, in this component of the study. We are starting with perhaps the most straightforward approach, which is stomach content analysis. And that is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Uh, so we have samples um, from by caught salmon sharks or stranded salmon sharks primarily. And uh, we have taken out the stomachs or we've had folks take out the stomachs for us. We've cut open those stomachs and we've essentially rifled through the contents and tried to categorize and identify um, the materials inside. And I just want to have a major shout out here to the two interns who have been doing this with me, Chloe and Charlotte. Um, they're not very squeamish, which as it turns out is a great trait for an intern in this field. Um, so they've been doing a lot of the heavy lifting here. Now this has actually become very challenging for a variety of reasons. As you can see on that top right picture, a lot of what we get are just piles of material of bones. We have slurry, we have eyeballs. Um, that are really hard to identify and quantify. So we are actually hoping to couple this with a more genetic based analysis um, in the next year or two. But there are some materials that we can bring out and identify. Most specifically, those are otoliths, which you're seeing on the bottom right hand there. Um, those are unique to each species, those inner, inner ear bones, and um, they don't digest as quickly or they're often expelled. So we can identify and, and count the number of otoliths we're seeing in the stomachs. And we also can do something very similar with squid beaks, which have a very relatively unique appearance um, for each species. So that's primarily what we're getting out of the stomach contents. Um, and again, huge shout out to the folks at the bottom there, the West Coast Observers Program and ASHOP and Noel Yoakum, both of them or all of these groups have really um, contributed largely to to all the samples that you are seeing here. Um, but what's very cool is that we are hoping to to look at these stomachs and examine, OK, how does diet vary by geographic location? Is it different up in the Gulf of Alaska compared to off the coast of Oregon, for example? Are we seeing variations in sex or size? Um, so we do have samples from both males and females um, and across somewhat of a size spectrum and a geographic spectrum. 
So what you're seeing on that top panel is the number of shark samples we have on the y-axis by geographic location on the bottom. We have two male sharks from the Bering Sea Research Charter from Noel. Um, and then we have actually a lot of strandings of juvenile males uh, along the Oregon coast. And so I only have the results of one um, in this presentation, but I think I have two more dead individuals at least in the freezer right now to, to look through. Um, so those are the smaller males. And then of course the whiting fishery, um, the observers in the whiting fishery have gotten us a ton of samples. And a majority of those have been bigger females, um, but I think we've gotten one male from there as well. So this is all to say, and I will repeat this a lot throughout this presentation. If you have any samples that might be of interest, or if you know of someone who happens to see a lot of dead salmon sharks, uh, please let me know because I would love to get inside of them. And then on the bottom graph, what you're seeing here is just the variation um, in size. So like I said, salmon sharks range in size. What we're seeing primarily is that we're getting smaller males, which we expect, and larger females. Um, and I will just note here that it is thought that salmon sharks uh, sexually segregate, where we are seeing bigger females kind of in the northeastern coast and then maybe males up toward the Bering Sea. Um, I'm going to touch on that a little bit more at the end when I talk about our colleagues' work. Um, but just to keep that in mind, this kind of aligns with what we know about the species so far. So if we dive a little further and look at the variation in geography and like what we're seeing where these animals were collected, we do see some differences in diet between Alaska and Oregon. Um, so again, we only had a few sharks from Alaska and I would love to have more, um, but you're seeing the average number of that prey item per shark of all the shark samples we have on the y-axis in both graphs. And on the top graph, you're seeing that we have evidence of flatfish and potentially Pacific tomcod. Um, after recently speaking with collaborators, I need to revisit that otolith and ensure that ID. So that's why there's a question mark there. And then in Oregon, though, we're, we're not surprisingly seeing mostly whiting. Again, a lot of these are coming out of the whiting fishery. But we're also seeing evidence of rockfish and squid, which we think are probably California market squid. What's of interest though, is that um, thus far there are no salmon and there could be a variety of reasons for that, right? Our sample size is not huge. Um, it was also primarily, uh, these, these samples were primarily collected during the summer months. So if there's any sort of seasonal change in diet, we do not yet have access to stomachs from other times of the year. Um, again, we would love to get those and I have another year on this project to do so. So stay tuned for hopefully a little bit more information. But another reason um, that we might not be seeing salmon is because stomachs really only give you um, a very brief snapshot of what the shark has recently eaten. Um, and so, for example, uh, in the in the Pacific whiting fishery, we're seeing a lot of whiting because they're probably eating whiting when they're caught. Um, so we're hoping to supplement that diet analysis using the stomachs with stable isotope analysis. So we've been asking folks, including the observers, to collect muscle, blood, um, and liver samples for us, if possible, because those tissues and, and blood, they store materials um, of what these animals have eaten over much larger time scales. So we can actually get better insight into um, what sorts of things these sharks might be eating even months prior to when they're actually sampled. So we have many of those samples uh, available to us from those same sharks that we had the stomachs for. And we will be sending those samples out to Dr. Aaron Carlisle at the University of Delaware, um, I think by the end of this year. So we should have those data um, hopefully very soon. Now, a final step of this part of the project is adding in some cool tech. So we are using biologgers and CATS cams, which are those orange devices you're seeing on the dorsal fin of that shark in the upper left-hand corner. Um, these record uh, camera footage underwater, which I'll show you in just a moment, but they also act as animal Fitbits, right? So they're accelerometers, they give us information on body movement and we can infer behaviors from that as well. And we're gonna use those CAT scams for a few things. First, um, they can give us a shark's eye view of what these animals are doing. So right now you're getting a shark's eye view of the coast of Alaska. 
Um, and in other shark species like tiger sharks or white sharks, they've actually been able to identify prey items based on hunting observed on these cameras. So we are going to try to put a few of these cameras on hopefully within the next year to see if we can get any sort of um, any sort of hunting event ca uh, captured on film. So I think that's very cool. Um, so that's the next step. And then in addition, um, we're hoping to try to learn a little bit more about the energetic requirements of these sharks. Now, this is not new work. Um, there's a paper, Manishan et al., out of our collaborator, Andy Seitz's lab. They published a paper a few years ago starting to look at this question um, because it's important to understand what the energetic requirements for these animals are to identify how many salmon, for example, they might have to eat to offset those energetic requirements. And you can actually see that table there from the, the Manishin paper where they start to estimate the energy density of all these potential prey items. Now, a key challenge to this though, is that um, a lot of the equations required to estimate energetics depend on physiological and behavioral data that um, is currently unavailable for salmon sharks. For example, um, we still don't know how fast they swim and swim speed is a really critical component of measuring energetic requirements. So we're hoping to inform some of those equations um, a, a little bit more robustly using these types of, of tags. And if you wanna learn more about this whole process and the equations, um, I recommend you look at the Manishin paper. Right. So once we've established the foraging ecology of individual salmon sharks, we then have to move in to look at how this broader population might be impacting Chinook salmon in the Northeast Pacific. Um, and to address that, we're going at this two ways. First, we have to figure out how many salmon sharks there are. Uh, and second, we are trying to map their distribution, figure out where they are, and again, how often they overlap with Chinook salmon. Now, how many salmon sharks there are is probably the most pie in the sky part of this project. Population modeling is certainly not easy, particularly when data is scarce. Um, so this could be a really critical component of our project. We really need some bounds on the size of the salmon shark population here. There aren't any estimates really currently. Um, but we are working with Francesco Ferretti at Virginia Tech and a few other folks um, here on this side of the US to try to figure out what data sources are available and that will inform which models we can use. So again, this is a part of the project that I think we would love to do if we can get the appropriate information. So if anybody here um, knows of fisheries dependent or independent data um, for salmon sharks, uh, please let me know after the talk because that would be really, really useful for this. So that's all I'm gonna say um, because we're still really working on this component of the project, um, but it is something that I would love to do moving forward. But in addition to that, we have made some strides on species distribution modeling for salmon sharks. So figuring out what drives their movement patterns and, and whether one of those drivers is Chinook salmon. Um, we are working with data from the top project, which I mentioned earlier, and that's coming out of Stanford. And we're also working with a lot of NOAA folks here as well. So again, that graph on the left should look pretty familiar to you. Um, those are satellite tag data, the same satellite tag data I showed you in the first few slides. So what I didn't tell you earlier is that satellite tag data really comes from when, oh, other slides not advancing. Um, See the slide with two figures on the left is the tagging data. Okay. Yeah, that's what you should be seeing. Sorry, I just saw a comment pop up. Okay. I think we're okay. Um, okay, so satellite tag dating, or sorry, satellite data comes from um, when we place a tag on the, the dorsal fin again. And basically every time that tag pops out of the water when the shark is at the surface, we get an estimated location via satellite overhead. So all of those points on this graph indicate an estimated location um, for those sharks. Um, 
And so it's important to keep in mind, of course, that there's a little bit of bias there because the sharks have to be out of the water. So we're just inferring movement tracks from those surfacing events. So the way that these species distribution models work using this type of data, if you're not familiar with them, is that we have our satellite tag data, that's our presence data, and then we collect a lot of different uh, environmental variable information. And all of those environmental variables can be extracted at the location that that shark pops up. So the location of the shark, we have corresponding environmental data. We can plug those into a model. In our case, we're using general additive models and then produce a response curve that shows the relationship of that environmental variable um, to the likelihood of detecting a shark there. And finally, we can generate predicted distributions of those animals based on the models that we create. Now, for, for our models, we're interested in a few different things so far. Um, one of them is chlorophyll, so we're looking to see if these sharks track primary productivity. We're also interested in sea surface temperature, um, climatic variables, in this case, the North Pacific gyre oscillation. We're also recently interested in eddies. Um, it does seem like there might be eddy activity attracting white sharks, for example, in the Northeast Pacific. Um, so we're including information on sea surface height there. And then, of course, we're interested to see if distribution or behavior has really changed over time or seasonally. So we're including month and year in our models as well. And then we're breaking down some of these variables into region. Um, so if you're not familiar, there's um, a set of established Longhurst oceanographic provinces, which really just correspond to different biophysical forces um, in the Northeast Pacific and globally. So, for example, we can use these to look at whether um, the sharks are more likely to be in coastal areas like ALSK or CCAL on this map by month or year. Um, and that might tell us a little bit more about when and where they're encountering potential salmon as well. So this is very, very preliminary, but just to show you how these models are going to work, this is not at all our final output, um, we can use our models to create graphs like this one, which show the response curves that I mentioned a few slides back. So you have the probability of detecting a shark on the y-axis, um, and then in our top graph, we have month, and our bottom graph, we have year. And then each of those colored lines corresponds to a different Longhurst region, as you see in the map on the right. So, for example, if you look at the red line on the top graph, that's ALSK, so that's coastal Alaska. And we see a peak in that red line in March and again in August. In contrast, for the CCAL, that's coastal California, and the blue line on that top graph, we see a peak later in the spring and then later again in the fall. So there does seem to be a little bit of variation in the regions that they're occupying by month. And similarly with year on the bottom, um, we are seeing um, higher probability of detecting salmon sharks uh, earlier on in our data set, which spans from 2002 to 2015. And I have not yet incorporated the 2015 data. So here it's to 2008. But in general, we are seeing um, an increased probability of sharks in Alaska earlier and an increase in sharks in the coastal California region a little bit later in our data set. Now, these are, again, not conclusive results, but I think they demonstrate what we can do with these models and what we're working to build on um, at the moment. And then, of course, once we do that with the salmon sharks, um, we have to do something very similar with the Chinook salmon. Um, and for this, we're working with um, a variety of different folks at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and NOAA, um, and I was really lucky to be able to go out with um, Andy Seitz and Michael Courtney and Dave Huff and Joe Smith, all of those folks as they were doing their tagging of adult Chinook salmon up in Alaska earlier this summer. So that's what you're seeing here. And these guys are deploying uh, pop-up satellite archival tags, which can give us really good information on where these animals are going when they're offshore, when they're out of range of any sort of um, coastal receiver arrays, um, or beyond, of course, observation. And what's also very cool is uh, Andy's group in particular has been working with these tags for a few years, and they've actually been able to show evidence of salmon shark predation on Chinook salmon um, up in Alaska doing, doing this exact same method. 
So what you're seeing in this graph, which is from the sites at all in 2019, um, is recovered um, PSATs or those tags. And any uh, salmon that is thought to have remained alive during the time it was tagged or the tag popped off um, is here in black. And anywhere where it was inferred that that Chinook salmon that was tagged was eaten by a salmon shark uh, is in red. And same thing with marine mammals in yellow, et cetera, et cetera. And the way they do this is really cool because essentially if the predator consumes a salmon that's tagged, if it's an endothermic predator, which salmon sharks are, you see a spike in the temperature reading and can correlate that with the estimated internal temperature of uh, a salmon shark's stomach, for example. So if you want to learn a little bit more about that, I recommend visiting this paper. It's very interesting. Um, but in general, it does lend support for the fact that salmon sharks are likely consuming Chinook salmon, at least up in Alaska. And generally, the next steps for this part of the project are really hypothetically this. So we have a model of distribution for salmon sharks and one for Chinook salmon as well. And using a variety of different equations and metrics, we can actually start to look and see, is there ever overlap between these two distributions? Maybe there's not, as you see on the bottom left. Maybe as in the middle, there's some overlap in certain regions or at certain times of year. Or in the right, maybe salmon shark distribution always overlaps with that of Chinook salmon. Um, perhaps they're specializing or even tracking Chinook salmon. Um, but that will lend us a little more insight into where and when they might be encountering these potential prey items. So, as you can tell so far, we have a lot more to do. We would love more stomachs to do more stomach content analysis. Um, same thing with the stable isotope samples. We would love to do more targeted tagging efforts for satellite and camera tags, both up in Alaska and off the coast of Oregon and Washington. Um, if we can, we would like to manage some population modeling with the available data. And of course, that species distribution overlap that I just showed you still needs to be calculated. Now, all of that is kind of a project that I've been leading with the help of many, many, many folks. Um, but what I also think is very cool is I've been really focused on just one side of the salmon shark story, and that's really the Northeast Pacific side. So folk ranging from the Gulf of Alaska down to the coast of Oregon. But salmon sharks roam throughout the North Pacific. And so I'm just gonna highlight the work of a collaborator of ours, um, Sabrina Garcia, who um, has been kind of trying to fill in the other part of this puzzle. So in 2017, uh, Sabrina and her colleagues at the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, University of Alaska Fairbanks and NOAA, um, initiated a satellite tagging program in the Bering Sea, which has expanded to the Northeast Pacific. Um, and most of the sharks caught in the Bering Sea, as I think I mentioned earlier, are males. So again, that big tagging of Pacific predators data set that I showed you is largely big females. And so this offers a really unique opportunity for satellite tagging and tracking. Now here, this team encounters salmon sharks um, and opportunistically tags them as they're encountered on trawl research surveys. So what you're seeing in this video is a salmon shark that was caught in a trawl um, as it was going back towards the caught end of the net. Um, and I should note that these are primarily, uh, these trawl surveys are primarily focused on salmon, which is really interesting. Now to date, this team has tagged six sharks in the Bering Sea, again, five males and only one female. Um, and they've also gotten to tag uh, two sharks, a male and a female in the North Pacific generally. Um, and as you can see on that bottom right hand picture, most of these sharks were actually double tagged with two different types of tags. Um, so you see a, a tag there on the dorsal fin and then one kind of into the dorsal musculature. Um, so they contain an archival tag that records depth and temperature for a year. And then the spot tag, which transmits the location, like I said, anytime the shark is at the surface. So the spot tag is more in line with the data that I have access to at the moment. And you're gonna see a few graphs of these tracks next. Um, so each dot you see on these maps are again, the estimated daily position for the shark throughout the year. So this is shark A tagged in 2017. This was a male tagged in the Bering Sea um, and it was tagged in August and immediately swam down to the Oregon coast in November. Um, and it remained on the west coast of the US essentially throughout the winter um, and then returned to the Bering Sea in July. 
And this shark's return to the Bering Sea is actually really interesting because it happened after many salmon species have completed their return migration to their natal rivers. Um, and the shark also bypasses South Central Alaska and Bristol Bay, which is where many species and stocks of Pacific salmon are present. So this maybe does not lend support for the fact that they are directly tracking salmon all the time. Um, and actually, this migration tends to match those of the female sharks that are found in the productive areas of Alaska in the summer and then migrate further south and remain in the California current ecosystem for winter and spring. So it does tend to match a little bit more of the data that I showed you earlier. But this is shark B, um, year one of tagging on the left, year two on the right. Uh, and this demonstrates that even the same shark can have variable movement patterns from year to year. So in year one, the shark spends a lot of time, leaves the Bering Sea, um, and spends a lot of time in kind of the North Pacific generally. Um, but on the right, that shark kind of keeps going back and forth um, between the Bering Sea and the rest of the Pacific, which is really interesting. Um, but while these two maps show how different this migration was, you can also see that there are areas that the shark makes repeat visits to. Um, and specifically, these indicate areas around seamounts and back to the Bering Sea. Uh, there is no data for shark C at the moment because the spot tag antenna broke. If you want more information on that shark, please talk to Sabrina. Uh, but for shark D, which was tagged in actually earlier this year during a winter salmon survey in a Russian research vessel, um, the shark was tagged in March and there's only a few months of data. But you can see that this, this migration doesn't really match any that you just saw. Um, so this shark is kind of roaming throughout the Northeast Pacific generally and not repeatedly making those forays back to the Bering Sea yet. Um, Sabrina is also working with colleagues in Russia that were supposed to deploy a few tags this summer. I think that project's been a little bit delayed, but we are also hoping to get tags coming out of Russia as well. Um, and finally, the last shark, Shark E, again tagged earlier this year. This has just been a few months, um, but it did again, something totally um, unexpected and actually just went immediately to Russia after tagging and it's been spending its time along the Russian coast. So instead of immediately leaving the Bering Sea like the rest did, um, it just went west. So we're, we're trying to figure out what the shark is doing at the moment. Um, and Sabrina and I are working together to again, try to figure out what these movement patterns are um, among different groups of this population. So for future efforts on Sabrina's team, and again, if you have questions about this, I encourage you to reach out to her directly. Um, they're going to continue to opportunistically deploy on vessels sampling throughout the Pacific, which is very cool, and, and add more recent information um, and data from a different part of the Pacific than we have currently. And they're going to be using genetic tissue samples also to determine if sharks from the eastern and western North Pacific are actually distinct, which I think is also a really critical part of this story. Now, I'm just going to conclude by saying um, that these projects are obviously highly collaborative and we rely on a lot of folks who have heard about salmon sharks, who know a lot about them, but don't know an outlet to share that information with um, to give us give us that information. So um, we've, we've relied on community scientists. We talk to a lot of the fishing communities to see where they're seeing salmon sharks. Here in Oregon, we're asking folks to report those shark sightings so we can kind of target our our tagging efforts. Um, and so if anybody here again has any information or would like to contribute to any of these collaborations, please reach out to me. Um, and I'm sure Sabrina would welcome further collaboration as well if it's more specific to the stuff that she showed today. And finally, I just want to say, I think this project is a really cool part of this story, right? Salmon are obviously really critical fish species in the Northeast Pacific. Um, and while this is just one link that I have been working to explore, I think it's the first step in, in learning a little bit more about the different links um, throughout this ecosystem. So it's offering, I think, a little bit more perspective um, on the bigger picture for salmon generally um, and the different predators they might be encountering in this region. And with that, I, I have so many collaborators uh, and I have to just thank them all for helping kind of conceptualize the study and offering guidance for interpreting the results and offering direction as to where to go. So um, again, this would not have happened without 
any of the folks listed here and, and many folks beyond that as well. So if you have any questions, I can take them now. Thank you so much, Alex, for such an awesome presentation. Um, and I guess at this time, we'll take any questions. We have a couple in the chat already. The first uh, was somebody asking if you have any data from Washington. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do actually, and that's really recent. So I didn't include that in this talk because we haven't had the chance to go through it. But Dave Lowry and a few other folks at WDFW um, reached out to us a few months ago and recently got us some stable isotope samples. And um, they had a whole database of salmon shark reports that they had found. Uh, and so we've been really fortunate to be able to work with them and I'm looking forward to diving into those too. Awesome. We have another question asking if you're getting any depth data from your tags. Good question. Um, we, I am not working with depth data. Our models are all pretty surface level distribution and that's for a variety of reasons. But um, as I think I mentioned, Sabrina's tag should be showing some depth data. So I think that's an, like, I, there's so much we don't know about salmon sharks and I think that's a really critical component of it as well. So I would stay tuned for Sabrina's work or she gives a talk here sometime. Maybe she'll show those results too. Awesome. And um, just for everybody else, you're welcome to raise your hand with the hand raising function or unmute yourself or pop more questions in the chat. I'm sure Alex would be happy to answer any of them. We got another comment from Bob. He says, thanks, Alex. Davey Lowry used to be his boss, so he figured you might have been in contact with him. <laughs> no, he's been extremely helpful um, with the whole getting samples from Washington story. Yep. Dave seems Dave, very Dave's the shark guy. Yeah, I was going to say, he seems like really into the shark thing, which I love. So, And I'll get you in touch with uh, Lisa Hillier, who's kind of our shark person now. I, I used to do some of it, but I'm way too busy doing other things. Um, okay. So we'll, we do get occasional uh, sightings in Puget Sound, um, which yep. is, and it always corresponds with when the Chinook fishery is happening. So uh, anyway, so, and the other comment I was going to make was years ago when I was an observer in the Gulf of Alaska Bering Sea, every time we got salmon sharks in our trawls, and I was specifically on Pollock boats, um, there were always bycatch of Chinook. So it was a, it was a hundred percent. When you had Chinook, or when you had a salmon shark, you had Chinook. So okay. just another potential data source for your model. So okay. I do a lot of species distribution modeling as well. Yeah, yeah. So you you understand the challenges of that. I think um, that you're not the first person to tell me that about the Pollock fishery. And I've been trying to get in touch with someone who can see if they'd be interested in providing any samples. Obviously, we don't want anyone going after live sharks, but if they have just dead samples, we would love to take them off your hands or their hands. But um, it's so interesting because I, like that story, everybody has stories like that where they're like, oh yeah, salmon sharks, salmon sharks, you know, Chinook salmon, pinks. And, and I think that that's really cool because there hasn't really been kind of an overview of what we know about salmon sharks yet. So it's really cool to hear all the anecdotes and I've been spending a lot of time listening to people and their stories. So thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Yeah, great talk too. That was, that was, that was fun to hear. Thanks. We have a comment and question from Michael Larkin it says, I am in Florida and not familiar with shark strandings. We have dolphin strandings, but not shark strandings. Are these strandings common in the Pacific and do sharks get caught on a falling tide? Uh, that's a really good question. I can, I would say shark strandings are not, uh, it depends on the species generally. Um, so like, like I think was mentioned in my introduction, I also work with basking sharks and they do strand sometimes as well. Um, in For the salmon sharks in particular, there's I think two prevailing hypotheses for why they might be stranding. Down in California, they've been seeing like a some sort of brain disease. Uh, so individuals have been washed ashore with some sort of bacteria in their brain and that was thought to be maybe a cause of the stranding. I'm not up to date on that story quite yet. Um, and then up in Oregon, we get them and we think it might be some sort of like thermal shock, but we aren't totally sure why they strand. Um, 
the individuals that have stranded tend to be these small juvenile males um, and they don't seem to be in poor health at all. So I don't know if it's a falling tide or, or if it's something happening in the water that's driving them ashore. Any more questions? Don't be shy, everybody. <laughs> uh, question from Corey, why do they surface? That's a super good question. I don't actually know that I'm going to have the, the answer to that either. Um, but we do know that we've seen them doing what's like, we call it finning. Um, they're seen to be finning around, um, around salmon fishing vessels sometimes. Um, so, so yeah, so I think I'm not totally sure why they surface and there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, research going on right now as to like vertical dive behavior in, in sharks generally. And the reasons that sharks dive and surface totally varies depending on the species. For some it's thermoregulatory and for others, it might be some form of navigation. Um, but for salmon sharks in particular, I actually don't know why they remain at the surface. Um, it could be, it could certainly have something to do with their foraging strategy. Um, but it's a really good question. Any more questions for Alex? <laughs> give everybody a little bit more time. And if we don't get any, we'll give everyone back some time. <laughs> All right, seeing no more questions, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining us today and for your excellent presentation, Alex. We really appreciate it. Thanks, yeah, and if anybody has um, questions or comments or data to share after this, please send me an email. Awesome, well, we hope to see you all next week too for our next speaker. Um, have a great week. <laughs>